Are you a retail or institutional investor interested in Bitcoin mining companies? The Miner Mag brings you free data and analysis from all major NASDAQ listed Bitcoin mining operations to know who stands out. Check out visualized metrics and data dependent stories at theminermag.com. Welcome back to the Mining Pod. Matt is off this week. He's not feeling too good. Matt, if you're listening later, I hope you're doing better. We'll catch up with you. He was on Oslo at the Freedom Forum. He's also a Bitcoin prog, so he had a full week, our world correspondent. But instead, we have Charlie. Charlie, welcome back to the show. Yeah, I'm here. I'm like the best value Matt or the great value Matt. Mm-hmm. Where I'm here, it works, but nothing can quite compare. You are the Oklahoma to his Texas. It's true. <laughs> Yeah. Now we got a lot of mining stories this week, and we are appreciative of your time. I don't know if we have any ordinal stories, unless you sneak one in there for us. I will. I managed to railroad most conversations into ordinals related to stuff, but ordinals and mining they go together like peanut butter and jelly. They do. They do. Okay. For those listening, we got a lot of mining content this week, which is great. Lots of different news. We're going to go through the new hash rate map. I guess you could call it, from Kareem Helmy and Coinmetrics, which came out earlier in the week. That made some big waves. We're going to go to Blockstream, talking about the Q3 2024 debut of their anticipated mining rig. Go over to Iris Energy, talking about the implications of them defaulting through their SBVs on debt with NYDIG. Then we'll take a quick little segue down to Argentina, talk about what Crusoe Energy is doing with a new video about one of their flare gas sites. To start, honestly, we have to do the BlackRock news. It's not mining, but it's it is BlackRock. So, give us your give us your summary of that, and we'll jump into hot takes on it. Yeah. So, um, BlackRock filed for an ETF, I believe. Again, I'm still kind of catching up with the story, but is it actually a trust now? Or, but anyway, it's an ETF. But I mean, uh, this is ironic uh, because. Larry Fink, BlackRock CEO, six years ago said, quote, Bitcoin is an index of money laundering. And that was at Bitcoin at 6K. What's interesting to me is that this is an ETF at the bottom of a market. Like typically we see these things at the top. Everybody rushes in to file and the SEC goes and says no to all of them. But I am, I mean, I have a hard time imagining the SEC saying no to BlackRock. So um, there's a lot of hot takes around this and I'm just, I, I imagine there's a lot more that I don't know than I do know about this currently. It's fair. Okay, I'm going to pull up a tweet from... This guy's name is hard to, hard to say correctly. Eric Balkunas. That's my best approach gotcha. at it. Yeah. Yeah. He is the lead ETF reporter and editor uh, at Bloomberg, and he's talking about this filing. So Coindesk first got the scoop. A lot of people didn't believe it. A lot of people saying that it's probably not great to put that out there because there wasn't a lot of sourcing. Looks like the sources was true, proved to be true within a few hours. Uh, the filing went live on the SEC website after markets closed, pretty typical for that to occur. And then, of course, the ETF versus Trust Boys came out on Twitter and we had like a lot of financial back and forth, a lot of reply guys. At the end of the day, the structure of it, apparently, since it's a commodity for this trust, trades similar to an ETF, so most people say it's an ETF. And we have this guy from Bloomberg saying as much. Now to like the bigger question, what does this do for everyone? Now it's sort of split, right? We have the Bitcoin maximalist take where it's like, this is terrible for Bitcoin. The institutional money is here and we don't want it all of a sudden. Uh, we don't want people buying our Bitcoin. Block- BlackRock is basically the US government and they're going to buy up all our coins. They're going to be able to fork the network. They're going to like neuter the whole Bitcoin project. That's one take. The other take, which I think is a little bit more enlightened, if I may have myself in the back, is... You have someone buying your coins now in a structured way if this does pass. And even if it doesn't pass, it does show you that BlackRock is serious about entering to this market. There's other markets like this. Uh, notably, Franklin Templeton has some sort of tokenized version of something similar for this. So these things do exist. And this is like a shot at like your Liz Warrens of the world and others and your Gary Gensler of the world who are against Bitcoin and have not been allowing TradFi and crypto to interact it's always been the knock on crypto, right? It's like crypto is its own ecosystem. Well, crypto people would love for institutional money to come in. And here you go. We have BlackRock saying as much. Any follow-up thoughts on that? 
Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to have your cake and eat it too. Um, like, do you want Bitcoin to be this black hole that sucks everything, or do you not? Do you want Larry Fink to come around and and like Bitcoin, or do you not? I generally take a stance that anybody anybody buying Bitcoin is generally better for the network than them not buying Bitcoin. Um, this is just going to introduce new mechanics, new dynamics. Bitcoin currently behaves, I believe, as more of a risk off asset. Does this begin to have it evolve more to an institutional product or commodity? We will see. We will see indeed. I thought it was great. Bitcoin kind of moved on the news. I think it rallied a little bit going into the weekend. It's yeah, it's hard to know. It's up a little bit um, since we started this podcast, so we better keep recording just to keep it going up. Okay, we have a special guest joining us <laughs> right now. Turn up Tatum. It's Tatum and turn up, but that's fine. We can go the other way. But what's up? Did you brand your own name? Because it's kind of on other people to give you a like a nickname. I really I can't even remember how it actually happened. We won't go there right now. Don't worry. And he's wearing it. he's wearing the Damas hat, which uh, I believe is in jeopardy right now. Apple Store Damas is it going to be? Is what do you think? What's your hot take, Tatum? Yeah, so it's going to stay on the. Apple Store or, or in the uh, App Store, but their Will is going to remove uh, Zaps on Notes. It's the individual notes that were what was causing everything for some reason. But you can still like go to someone's profile and zap them. But for some reason, the notes like looked like it violated. It didn't really violate their terms and, and stuff. Mm. It was real weird. But uh, Will's Will's upset. But I mean. He's going to build around it. He's working on a desktop client now. And not me, the Will, who actually invented something useful. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, I, guess just the, I just popped my Will. The actual smart Will. Yes. Okay, we got to get your take on, on BlackRock. But before that, give us your intro and like sh- shill between two ASICs and your new podcast as well. Yeah, uh, I have a, a YouTube show, Between Two ASICs. It's really uncomfortable to watch. Um and then I also have Between Two Nodes, which is a weekly podcast that I do. It's a little more serious, but just kind of like conversational. Um, it's fun to do. I, I wear a bulletproof vest for some reason. It just kind of happened, and now I'm stuck with it. So don't be alarmed if uh, you see me in a vest. But check me out on YouTube, Tatum Turnup. Is the vest hot? Oh, my God, dude. It's, it's so hot, man. Like, Miami sucked. But every time I took it off, it was just like, it's like when you commit to a bit, it. just like a media tip yeah. here for you, free. This is a free one for you. When you commit to a bit, it's got to be, you know, you got to be able to produce it into the future forever. And yeah. now you're stuck with a bulletproof vest on. Dead Mouse doesn't DJ with the big house mouse head all the time anymore. You could like take, you can, you can mm-hmm. put it on kind of like to come out on stage and then take it out, take it off for like for your day to day activities. I like that. I'm going to try to start like easing that into into my into my production now. Yeah, keep the keep the tie. Okay, what's happening with BlackRock? We we're just talking about it. I thought it was bullish, bullish or bearish, Tatum. I'm almost kind of split, uh, just because like it's it's weird. It's at a weird time, um, but I mean, if you look at it, like BlackRock is going to be the whale of all whales, essentially, um, and I saw, I I can't remember who it was, but someone posted a meme. It was like the year's 2030, BlackRock's trying to buy your coins for 2.5 mil. And it was like a picture of the up house with the buildings like around it because they didn't want to sell the house. And I was like, "Eh, that's fair. But um, one thing that I think might be a nothing burger, but I still kind of saw some weird timing with is the fact that they were with Coinbase custody and just the timing of the uh lawsuit with coinbase like i don't know if that means anything probably doesn't but i mean just seeing coinbase in a big news thing like that after sec filed a lawsuit uh was just kind of like hmm, i don't know but overall i mean i think it's bullish like uh, this is their their record of etfs is what over 500 wins and one loss or something like that so uh who knows it's bullish bullish for the yeah. space we don't do a lot of price talk on this show because you know we're responsible miners here just think about right. hash price so 
No, I think it's bullish. For Coinbase, it's another win on the custodial front. They're probably working on this for quite some time, and they do have other institutions they work with on this front, whether it just be like custodying coins, transferring coins, like white glove services. So that wasn't super surprising to me. And the SEC thing is just poor timing. But yeah, yeah. yeah. are you going to stick around for the full show, or are you going to get back to driving? Man, I, I don't want to drive. I, I needed a break. I've been driving for far too long, so I'm going to stick around. Okay, well, let's go to the next subject. We don't want to beat anything to death too much. We're going to talk about this new report from Kareem Helmy and Coinmetrics, essentially doing some back calculations to figure out how many of each machine is on the network in a very general sense. Uh, this report basically took the nounce patterns of different machines, sent them to the Luxor Relay, you're able to detect these nouns patterns and make uh, a graph based on that versus each machine type. And then from there, generalize it and understand how many different type of machines are actually on the network. Uh, this is useful for a few reasons, mostly because of energy bait. From this report, we were able to understand that there is less energy usage for the Bitcoin network than previously understood and also helped address the e-waste problem, which is talking about how long do these machines last, how long can you use them, and when are they actually just like, you know, wasteful material at a certain point. Uh, so some great research from both of them. Charlie, I throw it over, over to you first. I'll pull up some of the graphs for our YouTube audience. Yeah. Um, this is, to me, the seminal report in Bitcoin mining of the year. I consider the previous, the predecessor to this, which... Uh, like maybe three years old now, which kind of revealed the fingerprinting of the nonce data of the S9. Um, like that's one of the, my things I refer to the most. And I, I love seeing this. We at Luxor are happy to participate in the kind of relay mechanism to help identify the fingerprinting of these. Um, there's a lot of different takes we can have on this. Um, the first one I have is uh, a lot when a Bitcoin miner decides and does the numbers on like, is this a good idea? You can run your financials and you can run your models and everything, but a lot of your decision happens should be based on um, where do I fall within the kind of the the gradient of profitability as compared to other Bitcoin miners around the world, and this reveals a lot because we can look at the kind of perhaps break even cost of these various miners by network and more accurately define or identify like oh, um, if 60% of the network is running at this efficiency and we're going to, you know, say, you know, here's three different buckets of like power rates they might be on. Now we can actually have some data backed estimations on like deployment timeline and survivability and like where we stack up and things. So this is what I, I love this kind of research. I mean, there's a lot of little details I want to pull out like, um, like Kareem at all noted that the M32 on there uh, is colored a certain way. And that's really just because we can't differentiate between the M32 and M30S. I think the M30S is the more common proto, more common uh, basic type or ASIC minor. They usually they use the same chip. Um, so uh, this is really interesting. I'm going to be diving into this report and probably referring to it for the next year. I love this research. Um, it's just been this dark forest for the past decade of like, what is the landscape of, of, of ASICs on the network? Bitmain, like pretty much you just kind of have to like look at Bitmain's production numbers and then say, well, that's probably what it is. Now we can actually tell. I just, just looking at like different mining operations, this is no surprise to me that S19s are taking up a majority of the network. Um, their timing of release was with the last bull run was obviously very helpful just for the demand of it. But then you move on, we moved on to the XPs that were coming out and I was super excited about the XPs. Little did I know I don't like XPs. Um, and like looking at the market right now, you just see like, it, it looks like the most valuable miner at the moment is an S19 J pro. That's just my, my opinion. Um, and there's also data that suggests, you know, whatever you, your metrics are that you want to look at uh, is very subjective to what you think is the most valuable. But it, it just it does show like, like where the demand was, where, you know, they pivoted and where the Bitmain specifically pivoted and where they might want to pivot going forward. Because 
honestly, if we're looking at Bitmain specifically, I don't think they're going to do much with their uh, uh, hydro-cooled miners, just my thoughts. Um, but then you also have uh, MicroBT that's, you know, really, really trying to get into the immersion and hydro-cooling and doing a really good job of a uh, bunch of just the efficiency on their, like, M53S++. Like, that thing is, that thing's nice. Um, but those price points are going to be way higher, more institutional. Uh, and I don't think, I think Bitmain still going to rule the, the retail mining. Definitely. Yeah. Some follow-up numbers here. Uh, the metric for energy usage based on this report was about 13.4 gigawatts, which was 13% less, uh, than the index compiled by Cambridge University's Center for Alternative Finance, which was previously the best standard for estimating energy use by the network. So even for non-industry participants who are probably looking at this from a regulatory side, this report has a lot of implications. Okay, we shall leave that one there. Let's go on to the next one. Let's talk about Blockstream unveiling. I'm well, not really unveiling. Maybe like a Justin Sun announcement announcement here for its new miner, probably debuting in Q3 of 2024. This, of course, comes after they purchased Spondulis, an Israeli-based team that manufactured ASICs. Let me pull up the image for you guys. What do you guys think about this bad boy? I love the image. We finally have a new form factor introduced into the ASIC market. I love it. Is that an Ethernet port on this side? Is the fan blowing into your face or blowing out? It looks like that's the intake side. Um, I'm just so glad. I'll, I'll Matt, uh, Matt uh, hope he feels better. Um, I'll just copy his take. I'm just, I'm a little disappointed that we, uh, they didn't name it the Spondulis Miner because that name needs to be immortalized in Bitcoin uh, nomenclature. Tatum, any thoughts on this bad boy? Uh, the thing's massive. It's huge. It's a uh, large and in charge. Uh, so, I mean, my further, my further kind of comments on this is, um, so I don't know like the ASIC development timeline, but um, so Luxor, what they raised, not Luxor, sorry, Blockstream raised 125 million in January. And I guess they went right to work on acquiring and developing a timeline for this ASIC. I would love to see it hit their anticipated rollout of latter half of 2024. I guess one of my questions is like, 2024 is, or, you know, latter half of 2024, that's, that's a year and a half away. Yeah. Um, a lot happens in Bitcoin mining. We could be well into a bull market by then. Maybe we could be peaking in a bull cycle by then. And so I, you know, a lot of, a lot of, you know, the, the hardware side depends a lot on like where, where it's released in the market. So that's a really long ways away. I'm a little anxious to see, uh, how the timeline roll how the timeline plays out only thought i had on this one is the fact that everyone seems to want to make their own miner and like blockstream obviously had plans for quite a while right and they also have their hardware development with their their uh, jade wallet so they're not a company that hasn't done hardware in the past they can't do hardware in the future it is as always surprising to me to see all these different mining companies that are operators or software developers or what have you jump into the asic game basically trying to take out this Bitmain, MicroBT, duopoly or monopoly, even if you just want to call it that with just Bitmain. I don't know if it's a winning business strategy. I'm kind of bearish on the whole idea. It's so hard to supplant them. And maybe this does it though. And maybe like you are able to completely vertically integrate as you want. Uh, maybe the cost of manufacturing is going down. I will say that I won't look a non-Chinese ASIC manufacturer in the mouth to borrow the don't look the gift horse in the mouth. I think that's really valuable. I want to cheer on uh, the the market, the market either from the chip side or on the actual assembly side. I want to cheer that on. Um, I think that's good for Bitcoin, even if you know the rollout and deployment is lackluster. So, yeah, like like you said, it's a new form factor, but it's also massive. So I don't know, like you know, what that's going to look like uh, averting from that form factor. Um, I also was talking to uh, Drew and Rich, and they don't know any. I don't know. I also didn't look at the 
briefing once it came out, but uh, they said they didn't know too many specs on it. Um, I don't know if y'all covered that while I was trying to transition, but but I think that uh, of of all the companies out there that that could compete, I think that Blockstream would be one of the better competitors. Um, and I would like to see that though. I, I want to see a little more diversification in the um, mass manufacturing. Love it. Okay, let's go over to our second to last story for the day. Hopefully, you're enjoying this podcast. It's uh, it's been all over the place, man. Tatum, <laughs> sorry, offering man. again. My takes are bad. Matt was sick today. Charlie is the, the beaming light for this podcast. Yeah, I'm holding it down, baby. I'm just kidding, Tatum. I actually doing great. Good takes. Okay, we're gonna go back to Iris Energy. Revisit this whole story for just one moment. Iris Energy is now, I believe, a top five miner, definitely top 10 miner in terms of exahash. And also their execution, so if we're looking at like efficiency per exahash, is typically top three, if not number one, kind of jostle with uh, Clean Spark and Bit Farms. One sort of fleck in their armor recently was the fact that they defaulted on an SBV loan uh, with Nidig. Basically, Iris Energy set up a bunch of SBVs, so entities outside of Iris that were connected in a sense to Iris, but did not have any uh, financial obligations to Iris Energy, the core company. Took out a bunch of loans to purchase ASICs during the bull market. These loans were really big, and then after a while, they weren't able to pay them, and so they defaulted on them, and NYDIG was left holding the bag. And now there's a little bit of a back and forth between Iris Energy and NYDIG, NYDIG is claiming not only should they get the collateral being the machines, but they should also get the Bitcoin mined from the machines. While Iris Energy is contending that, no, that is not the case. You do not have the ability to get the Bitcoin mined from the machines because how they set up the structure of the entities ensured that they were not liable for paying out that Bitcoin, more or less. So we have a great conversation here from Wolfie Zhao over at the Miner Mag. Go check them out. Go check out their data and website. They also did a blog post about this. Uh, I just wanted to bring it up because I think there's some lasting implications from the last bear market and a bull market, I should say, where people got over their skis, they purchased things on too much debt, or they had interesting financial structures, and they could be paying for it during the next cycle when people are again trying to take out big loans. And you know, your credit history eventually does catch up with you. I don't know if this story speaks to you guys. I mean, I follow these public miners quite a bit, so I was interested to see this follow up from the miner mag team. Yeah, the uh, the the contracts you sign at the top of the bull get stress tested at the bottom of the bear. Uh, it's it becomes a game of survival and it becomes a game of kind of corporate institutional PVP here. I I, I do like to see Iris continue to execute. Uh, you know when certain parts or associations to it are under duress. Um, that's really impressive to see teams manage to somehow tread water build, deploy hash rate, and deploy hash rate efficiently while managing these other kind of spinning plates of, of legal dispute. Um, I think it's going, yeah, it is going, it's, it's interesting because we'll see, we may see a lot of interesting um, uh, legal, you know, treatment of this come out of it, which defines, you know, future disputes um, about like Bitcoin mined from the ASICs while, uh, while they're about to be defaulted on so yeah um i'm just glad uh, i i think everybody who didn't sign one of these asic back loans at the top is really happy they did it right now tatum did you sign one for some science um we won't talk about that actually but uh no the like we've seen so much capitulation from over collateralized asic loans basically and i don't I, i'm just I'm mainly curious that, like you said, what if this does turn into some, you know, precedent legal structure for these types of loans? We're setting a lot of precedents and learning a lot of lessons, but what are those lessons going to teach us? And are we going to have to learn uh, some other lessons, you know, in the next couple of years? Who knows? But it's been interesting to watch. It's been scary to watch, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just a, a learning and waiting game at this point, I th think. I'm just surprised how many people didn't go out of business that, you know, if you'd asked me nine months ago, like, Core Scientific's filing for bankruptcy, 
I forget the the list is long, and I and I'm kind of surprised we haven't seen more mass capitulation because, as far as I'm aware, the majority of the hash rate of these stressed miners is technically still plugged in wherever it is. Yeah, so like Core, Argo, a few other public firms; those are the ones we know of. Uh, yeah. Core did, Argo almost did. And then for every public miner, you could probably list three or four private yeah. that went through something. So good and points all have, around. And you have USBTC going on a buying spree all across you know North America. It's kind of impressive to see. I think we'll be able to reflect in a year from now who the real winners are from this down cycle. Definitely. Okay, let's finish with this video from Crusoe Energy. Charlie, you've watched this video. Where should we yeah. jump to it? Um, it's a long video. Uh, it's really just the it's the start. It's Coley Cavdis, co-founder of Crusoe Energy. They're one of the kind of darlings of fundraising for Bitcoin mining as it reduces uh, flaring in the oil field. Um, they've they're the largest one by uh, they're the largest one of their type by you know uh, units of methane mitigated. You can play like ten seconds of it. It's Coley trying to speak Spanish and he does pretty well. Y me llamo Kelly Kavnis, soy el presidente de Crusoe Energy Systems, el principal proveedor de soluciones de flaring, el gas que compañías de petróleo. Yeah, so you get some great overhead shots of their sites. We don't get many, like, actual, you know, shots of what their operations look like. And um, so this is our, in Argentina, so it's a, it's a partnership, I believe, with One Block Holdings. And they're doing a large project. I believe it can get up to, was it 200 megawatts is maybe the eventual scale. Um, we'll see. I mean, this is big. As a, as a guy who puts Bitcoin mines on, on gas wells, uh, you know, just a, a fraction of this size, um, this is big. This requires large producer coordination, a ton of generation, um, in the in the world of oil field service, generation's been at capacity for the past year, and they and it's certainly even more at capacity now. So, um, shout out to Crusoe for uh, executing this project. It um, I'm excited to see more videos. Now, this story is interesting. Again, we love this flare gas story. I think it's interesting, and I think it does like connect with people who uh, coming into Bitcoin mining. This is typically a story they gravitate towards. Crusoe Energy is based out here in Denver and then also San Francisco. No, gotten to know a few of the team over the last six months. They're really great people. So this is interesting to see that. At the same time, we do have to mention the lawsuit against them and Upstream that Upstream filed a little bit ago. No word as of now, but I think everyone can continue operating while that goes through the court system and they're going to continue to deploy uh, Bitcoin miners onto flared gas. So we'll see what happens with those mm. stories. Yeah, we'll see. Um, it It... It's uh, painful to see um, the suing of IP in the mining industry, especially in my corner of the world, which is um, oil and gas and Bitcoin mining. But hey, the oil field is no stranger to lawsuits. In fact, we have some of the longest tenured uh, um, precedent law in any industry here in the North American oil field. So it's only in tradition that that continues. You're not making money if you're not suing somebody. That's how it goes. Gosh. Well, we will call it a wrap. Charlie and Tatum, wherever you are, thank you for joining the show today. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, give us a like or a sub subscribe. We're also dropping below in the comment section on YouTube a link to a survey you can fill out. So if you enjoy the show, you listen to it consistently, we'd really appreciate if you give us some feedback there. Okay. From us at Mighty Pod. Thanks for listening. Talk to you guys. Peace. Soon.